our distinguished speaker and guest of honour, Mrs. Josephine Teo, Minister for Manpower, Second Minister for Home Affairs, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this year's Economic Society of Singapore's annual dinner. This year marks the 63rd year since the founding of the Economic Society of Singapore. As most of you would have known, the Economic Society is a non-profit organization of economists, professionals, academicians, and policy makers with great interest in economics. Established since 1956, the Society's primary objective is to raise public awareness and stimulate public interest and debate on economic issues. The Society had participated in providing important inputs for various government initiatives, such as the Forward Future Economy, the White Paper on Population, the Economic Strategies Committee, the Central Provident Fund Policy Changes Study, and policy options for the Singapore economy. The Society had also provided a platform for discussions on the annual Singapore government budget among experts and the general public by organizing a panel workshop post-budget annually. Now, I'm asked frequently about how the economy and the job market are doing or to predict the stock market. These questions are quite telling about the general public's interest in economics. They want to know about the economy and its underlying markets like the financial and job markets. But more importantly, they want to know how these markets are doing as it affects their livelihood. When I reply that these are not the area of economics that I'm working on, they are often left disappointed and leave wondering what kind of economist am I? Now, should they decide to continue conversing with me, I would often try to pique their interest in the wide-ranging field of economics. And this usually starts with the definition of economics in an accessible and more fundamental way. Economics is a study of how society manages its scarce resource among competing demands. And such a definition places economics in both the realms of the social sciences and the decision sciences. As such, economics is not just about investment, finance, and banking. It is also about making everyday decisions, such as purchasing groceries, major decisions like whether to buy a car or take public transport, where to live, what to study, and jobs to consider, and important life decisions like when and who to marry, and how many children to produce. Likewise, firms need to decide what to produce, how much to produce, when and where to produce. Governments need to effectively allocate public funds for public infrastructure and services, such as public safety, education, and pollution mitigation. In all these activities, it is necessary to involve the economic thinking of scarcity, choices, and trade-offs. As an environmental economist, I'm happy to hear Prime Minister Lee's talk about Singapore's climate change preparations in his National Day Rally speech. While Singapore continues to do its part to manage emissions and cut waste, we must focus on the critical and existential issue of climate change adaptation. Prime Minister Lee spoke about examining all options carefully. This is where economic thinking in terms of cost-benefit analysis one major tool in the economy's bag can help to assess, to assess the net benefits of competing or complementary solutions and serve as one of the metrics for policy efficiency. In actively promoting a series of activities and events, the society has drawn economic players from students to members of the profession in academia, the government and corporate sectors. A testament to this is the Society's Singapore Economic Policy Forum, called SEPF, that is held annually in October. A leading platform for economic policy discussion in Singapore, the forum allows policymakers, scholars, business professionals, students, and interested members of the public to exchange views on contemporary economic issues facing Singapore and Asia. 
The three universities, NTU, NUS and SMU, take turns to co-organise this forum with the society. We now invite our new sister university, Singapore University of Social Sciences, SUSS, to join us in co-organising this forum in the immediate future. Note, I didn't say in the near future, I said in the immediate future. Past forums have focused on economic and public policy issues to social issues including changing economic winds, aggregate employment, financial sector reforms, the Singapore economy, economic relations with ASEAN, China, and specifically also with Malaysia, and social safety nets. Last year's SEPF was on the theme Future of Singapore and Singapore in Asia, where topics including future of happiness, future of growth, and future of economic relations with our neighbours were covered. SMU will be hosting the upcoming this year's SEPF on external challenges to the Singapore economy and possible response. The Singapore economy faces strong headwinds. The uncertainties and inefficiencies from external causes, such as the US-China trade wars and its spillovers, are beginning to take root. These will test the ongoing structural socio-economic developments of preparedness, resilience and inclusiveness in Singapore. Prime Minister Lee in his National Day rally highlighted that Singapore will continue to invest in its people. He specifically highlighted the very young preschoolers, lower income tertiary students and older workers. This is on top of the various initiatives to prepare Singaporeans for a future economy some of which has been covered by our past annual dinner speakers like Deputy Prime Minister Heng Swee Keat and Minister Ong Yi Kang. I'm sure Minister Josephine Teo will highlight some of these initiatives as well. With the strong headwinds, the challenge is to ensure that these structural changes continue to take place while quickly mitigating possible downturn effects that affect large numbers of people. Again, the issue of scarcity, choices and trade-offs comes into play. <coughs> Some economists have made a distinction between the previous third industrial revolution and the current fourth industrial revolution in progress. In the third industrial revolution, on average, both, both global GDP and net employment rates were rising. But in the fourth industrial revolution, global GDP is expected to continue to rise while net employment falls. The trend can be attributed to the broad network effects of innovations and technologies like artificial intelligence and advanced robotics. These innovations know no boundaries, and they are sparking a new wave of globalization amidst the faltering of the trade-based one. The potential impact of this new wave, both positives and negatives, must be salient in our psyche and in our rational decision-making processes. With this in mind, the Society has just launched its new series of questions and answers with public officials and CEOs. Called the ESS 120 series, it hopes to allow maximum participation of ideas and discussion of controversial and contemporary topics as they affect Singapore. 120 stands for two hours of talk and discussion. The first ESS 120 was with Permanent Secretary Mr. Pang Kin Kiong, from the Transport Ministry with three panellists asking their questions, just like Hard Talk on BBC. The subsequent ESS 120 talks were on health, Professor Theo Serket, Chairman of the Singapore Medical Council, Labour and Manpower, Permanent Secretary Mr Albert Kam, who is here tonight, Population and Fertility, Deputy Secretary in the PMO's office, Jacqueline Poe, who is also here tonight, and all the talks were well received with good response straight from the floor and discussions. The forthcoming ESS 120 talk will be on law and regulations and it will be given by Permanent Secretary of Law, Mr. Ng Hao Yi. The society also continues to place a strong emphasis on education and nurturing young talents. The society's education committee actively engages teachers and students of economics through the annual Junior College Seminar Series, in which professional economists and university academicians participate as speakers on various contemporary economic issues. The Society had also launched 
the Outstanding Economics Teachers Award, up to two awards were given to outstanding economics teachers in Singapore who have exhibited excellence in the teaching and the learning of economics. Besides recognizing outstanding economics teachers, the award also promotes the sharing of best practices by outstanding teachers and encourages economics teachers to active and achieve professional excellence. I would like to thank the Ministry of Education's Curriculum Planning and Development Division, who have provided much support, inputs, and administrative details for the setting up of this award. I would also like to thank World Scientific Publishing, who has been sponsoring the Cash Award to be used for professional development. The recipients of this award are announced at the Singapore Economic Policy Forum every year. The Society also organizes student essay competitions with the original sponsorship which has continued to this day by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. The Society gives gold medal awards for outstanding graduates in economics at tertiary institutions and study tours. Through the essay competitions, the Society furthers its aim in encouraging members of the public and particularly the youth to learn about the role of economic thought and analysis in public policies in Singapore. Recent essay competitions which focus on non-traditional areas of economics were also launched. One was sponsored by the National Climate Change Secretariat. Another was sponsored by the Competition Commission of Singapore. The Society had also collaborated with yet another sponsorship from the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore. And to all our essay sponsors, a big thank you. The Young Professionals Career Wing, sort of ESS Youth Wing, is now in its sixth year. This initiative aims to attract young economists to participate in the society's activities and at the same time bring in fresh and new ideas to further develop and diversify the society's mainstream activities into relevant and contemporary issues of the young. The activities of this group include informal gatherings and social interactions among themselves with guest speakers and invitees from seniors and well-known professionals in government and industry with the occasional appearances by distinguished academia. This past year saw the Youth Wing organizing a major summit revolving around the themes of the future of financial services and the paradigm shift in the traditional world economics. I welcome those of you in the audience tonight who are young professional economists to join us in this endeavor to further rejuvenate the society. Many of you might be curious to know who can qualify to be a member of our young professionals uh, career wing. Well, he or she will have to be between ages 25 to 35 years old. But let us not quibble about whether those in the age 35 group qualify or not, as we can make exceptions for those slightly above the age of 35. However, however, we would draw the line at those who consider themselves young at heart. <laughs> ESS also looks across borders in its approach to encouraging dialogue. In line with the recent reaffirmation of France-Singapore bilateral relationships and the Singapore-France Year of Innovation, the first forum featured luminaries like Bertrand Barthé, former Managing Director of the World Bank, and Enrico Lita, former Prime Minister of Italy and the Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs, with guests of honour Mr. Taman Shamagaratnam, then Deputy Prime Minister. The Society had just concluded organising the second forum in March. Former Minister for Finance, Michel Sapan, and Minister for Digital Affairs, Monia Majobi, were in attendance with guests of honour, Minister Chan Chun Singh, Minister for Trade and Industry, and Minister Heng Sui Kiet, Minister for Finance and presently Deputy Prime Minister as special guests. The Society will be hosting the 44th Federation of ASEAN Economic Associations Conference this November. This year, the Federation will see the participation of economic associations led by the presidents of their respective countries from nine ASEAN countries the theme being the new ASEAN economy. The Society also offers a platform for inclusiveness of ideas through its academic journal called the Singapore Economic Review, 
which started out as the Malayan Economic Review in 1956. It is one of the oldest economic journals in Asia and is one of the few journals based in Asia indexed in the Social Sciences Citation Index. Published four times a year by the World Scientific Publishing, it is presently a leading journal in the Asia-Pacific region. The activities of the journal culminate with the biennial Singapore Economic Review Conference. The eighth conference was just concluded over three full days from August the 5th to the 7th this month. A total of 350 papers were presented and participants come from over 60 countries. Editors and co-editors of many top journals also attended. There are many other activities organised by the society throughout the year and this can be found in the President's report each year. For those of you who wish to know more about the society, please visit our website and we appreciate suggestions and constructive ideas to further strengthen and liven the society's mission and activities. You might have browsed through the society's bulletin, Place at Your Seat, called Economics and Society. The bulletin is so named as there is no economics without a society. Past issues have contained interesting articles that are highly relatable to the general public and relevant to our everyday lives. They revolve around the themes of economic development, the environment, and technology. Last year, the bulletin titled Man and His Neighbour focused on inequality, a highly topical issue that our President of Singapore, Madam Halima Yaakob, chose to speak on in a maiden presidential address in Parliament. This year's issue is titled Man and the Law, which examines the interface between economics and the law. Among the topics it covers, the market economy in relation to property rights, cost-benefit analysis and regulatory reform, behavioural economics and nudges to complement legislation and issues in competition law. We were honoured to have Minister for Law, Mr K. Shamugam, who wrote the foreword for this issue. As today's economic problems become increasingly complex, I was again reminded many times by my helpers that my speeches are also becoming increasingly complex and long. <laughs> Therefore, I would like to close by thanking the Society's members and sponsors, and especially our continued platinum sponsor for this evening's dinner, Cup Jamanai Consulting, and everyone present at the dinner for your generous support. I would also like to thank my predecessor presidents of the Society for the immensely important role in building up the society at its various stages, supported by an able council throughout and an efficient secretariat headed by Ms. Vivian Tan. And finally, on behalf of my fellow council members and the society, I thank our annual dinner guest of honour and distinguished speaker, Minister Josephine Teo, <coughs> for her encouraging presence, and we look forward to hearing from her. It is now my privilege and honour to introduce and say a few words on our guest of honour, Minister Teo. Mrs Josephine Teo was appointed Minister for Manpower on 1st of May 2018. She is concurrently the second Minister for Home Affairs. She also assists Senior Minister Teo Chi Hen on Population Affairs and previously served in Finance, Transport and Foreign Affairs Ministries. As the Minister of State for Finance, Mrs Teo co-chaired the Pioneer Generation Task Force and coordinated the government's successful implementation of the Pioneer Generation Package. As Senior Minister of State for Transport, she chaired the Changi 2036 Steering Committee to enhance Singapore's position as a leading global air hub. The committee's proposals led to the landmark decision to develop the third runway and T5, Terminal 5, at Changi East. As chairperson of the Public Transport Tripartite Committee, Mrs Teo ensured the effective transition to the bus contracting model and the establishment of the Singapore Bus Academy. A member of parliament since 2006, Mrs Teo was formerly chairman of the Government Parliamentary Committee for Education, and Assistant Secretary General of the National Trade Unions Congress. She represented the Labour Movement on the Government Appointed Economic Strategies Committee and co-chaired several subcommittees. 
Mrs. Teo was also concurrently Chief Executive Officer of the not-for-profit organisation Business China, a platform launched by the then Minister Mentor Li Kuan Yew and then China's and China's Premier Wen Jiabao to strengthen Singapore's bicultural foundations and remains as an advisor. She is an alumnus of Dunman High School and Raffles Junior College. Mrs. Teo graduated from the National University of Singapore, winning several honours, including the Rachel Meyer Book Prize for the, being the best woman student in 1990. I was uh, privileged to have Mrs. Teo in my class at that time, <laughs> together with her husband, uh, Mr. Teo. She was, I can attest, a good student. Now, Mrs. Teo obtained a Master of Science in Economics from the London School of Economics on a scholarship from the Economic Development Board. In 2015, we celebrated Singapore's 50th anniversary, and in joining that joyous commemorative occasion, I produced a book titled Singapore 2065, which had focused on the question of what will happen to Singapore in the year 2065. And 50 icons were invited in Singapore to contribute their thoughts on this subject matter. Minister Josephine Teo, who had graciously contributed a chapter to my book, Singapore 2065, wrote about three reflections based on the observations on her past, very early and later visits to two countries, growth and development, namely China and Egypt. The three reflections that she wrote were, one, no country can hope to run out of problems to solve, However, the problems differ in terms of severity and countries differ in their abilities to solve them. Secondly, very few citizens can hope to succeed unless their countries are also successful. And third, quality of leadership matters and is often the critical difference. She concludes by emphasising that because Singapore is a most unusual little red dot, we must take good care of her and leave an even brighter red dot than ever before. And that, my distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, sums it all up on our guest of honour for tonight's 63rd annual dinner. May I now invite Minister Josephine Teo to address us.